Three more. It's hard to believe. It's almost over. All right, once again, we're going through the seven feast days and how they are dress rehearsals of divine appointments. Passover being the dress rehearsal for Calvary. Unleavened bread, the dress rehearsal for the burial. First fruits, the dress rehearsal for the resurrection. Then counting 50 days after the resurrection, the descent of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. And then the Pentecost lasts for about three months, and then we have the fall feast. Trumpets is the rapture, and the call to Israel to repent. That's very important. It's the call to Israel to repent. And then atonement is the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation. And then the 15th is the tabernacles, which is uh, when Jesus returns and sets up the kingdom. Tonight we're looking at the atonement. Last week we tied it together with Revelation because a lot of times in the book of Revelation you see the same thing going on in heaven as it's going on down on earth. And it's important we need to see that because that's why we teach the tabernacle because the tabernacle is patterned after the one in heaven. And we have the trumpets in heaven and we have the, when they take coals out of the brazen altar and throw it to the earth. And of course we're not going to get into that study because we just don't have enough time. But you can see the tabernacle and the feast days in the book of Revelation. They're all in there. And it's, it really bothers me, I've never had it bother me so much as it does now, how Israel is just left out in our studies in the churches. They, mm -hmm. they have forgotten that this is not the church's book. That's right. This is Israel's book. We were grafted into Israel. They weren't grafted into us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and our roots go back to the Hebrew. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus still is a Jew. <laughs> he lived as a Jew. He went through all the, all the feast days. He fulfilled all the feast days. And I'm not saying that we should be celebrating these feast days, but we will be celebrating three of them during the whole thousand years. And we will be celebrating them as a memorial of what he had done and what he has done for us. But it's very sad that, that Israel is being left out because they have been taught... And, and myself as well, how it's, it's a church, it's a church, it's a church. Well, for this age, it is the church. But before this age, it was Israel. And after this age, it will be Israel. This is the only time period that it's the church, the church, the church. So this is a Jewish book, and I want us to, to remember that as we go through the rest of these feast days, because it's very important. Because if you think it, I want you to think of it this way. The trumpets, the church is gone. So now I want you to think of these three feast days without the church. Because the church is not mentioned again until we come back with Jesus to set up the kingdom. So these three fall feasts are speaking desperately to Israel. To Israel, as we'll see with the first one that we find in the book of Exodus. Now remember, they had, they had come out of Egypt. They had Passover. Their first Passover was in Egypt. Their first unleavened bread coming across the Red Sea. Their first first fruits when they got on the other side on the 17th. And then 50 days later, they were where? Mount Sinai. The Mount of God. The Mount of the Sword. And that's where they received the Word of God. That's where they received the law. Now remember, Moses had gone up. His first trip, he went up the mountain, and they had to all get prepared and everything. And Moses went up the mountain, and he received the word, the law from God. And it was just spoken. And then he goes back down, and he tells the people that they're to build a mound of dirt and stone, uncut stone, and make an altar. And that's where they're to worship, and so on. Okay, And then he goes back up. When he goes back up, he receives the law written on stone. Remember? Mm -hmm. And then while he's there, God tells him he needs to get back down because the people have sinned. And so he comes back down. And as he comes back down, he sees them dancing naked and doing all these horrible things and worshiping this idol of gold and so on. And so he throws down the law. And he breaks it. 
And he tells them, you know, I mean, he really comes down on them. And he has, he does all these different things. He melts it down and has them eat the dust and, and all of this. And then 3,000 of them die and, and so on. And then he goes back up the mountain. And when he goes back up the mountain, he says, I'm going up to make atonement for you. So what we see there is when Jesus came down, okay, the people had sinned a great sin. And he said, I'm going back up to make atonement for you. I want you to just think of Israel. He said, I'm going back up to make atonement for you. Atonement is speaking of the time of Jacob's trouble. I want you to look on page 37 of your notes. Keep these three, three I gave you to the side. They're a little extra. Look on page 30. We have the Feast of Atonement. Now the tribulation actually begins... When the, when the sound is, the call is told to Israel to repent, they only have 10 days. 10 days. Because on the 10th would begin the tribulation or the time of atonement. So if we look here on in the middle of our page, 37, it says, uh, Yom Kippur. And that, this is the most holy day unto Israel. You know when the high priest goes into the holiest of holies? on the holiest day, in his holiest costume, to do what? To make atonement for the tabernacle, for the altar, I mean for every piece of furniture, for himself, and then for the nation of Israel. Now there's a difference between the sacrifice on Passover and the sacrifice on atonement. Because on Passover, it's the individual, personal salvation of individuals. Okay? But atonement, that sacrifice was for the nation of Israel as a nation. When it speaks about all of Israel being saved, it's speaking of the nation of Israel turning back to God. See, now that's a difference. Mm -hmm. And here, here's something else. <laughs> the atonement speaks of Israel as the nation repents. And she does repent during the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why Jacob's trouble comes down upon her. Actually, the, the tribulation is for Israel. Yes, all people who are here upon the earth will suffer, but basic, basically it is for Israel. And she will repent as a nation. We're not talking about individual Jews. We're talking about the nation itself will repent and turn to God. So this is individual salvation when the Passover lamb was slain. And this is for the nation of Israel during the time of Jacob's trouble, during the tribulation when Israel repents. She's called to repent, and then she repents. And remember in Hosea? Remember Moses went up. Well, in Hosea it says, Jesus says, I'm going back, and I'll come back when you repent. Moses said, I'm going up to make atonement for you. He goes up to make atonement, and then he comes back. And he gives them the uh, building plans for the tabernacle that God can dwell with them. Jesus goes up <laughs> to make atonement. When he comes back down, what does he do? He builds the temple, the dwelling place here upon the earth for God. Do you see the picture? I kind of know I repeat it over and over again, but we really need to get this picture. So this is speaking of the national salvation of Israel. He said all of Israel will be saved. Well, everybody says, oh, that means every Jew? No. It means the nation of Israel. Today, as we speak, from Acts chapter 2 until Revelation chapter 4, the Jew gets saved, he's no longer a Jew, he's a new creature. He's part of the church. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a Gentile. But it's only for this period of time. Mm -hmm. Only this period of time. So every Jew who gets saved are now part of the church. They're part of the bride of Christ. But when that church is raptured in the Feast of Trumpets, then God deals with the Jews who are here upon the earth during that dispensation. It doesn't mean that every Jew is going to be saved. That would mean um, Judas. <laughs> that would mean he's going to get saved. No, he's not. He's in hell now, and he'll stay in hell. Mm -hmm. All right? And then he'll be taken out of hell and cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. So we just need to get the picture here because it will tie in
for next week because next week is a time that speaks of the Gentile nations, the tribulation. Because, see, the Jews were to offer 70 bulls during the Feast of Tabernacle. You find that in Numbers. And they were, they were to be a nation of priests. And they were to get saved. They offer the atonement for Israel here. And then Israel, as a nation of priests, were to offer the, the sacrifices for the Gentile nations in the Feast of Tabernacle. Now, how do we know that? Well, because they were to offer or sacrifice 70 bulls, one for each nation, mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. How many nations are in Genesis chapter 10? 70. And what did God say in Deuteronomy? That the bounds of the people or the nations were set according to the number of the Jews. How many Jews came from Jacob when they went into Egypt? 70 souls. Okay? We'll get into that a little deeper next week. But I want you to see this is the purpose. Here, the church is taken out of the way altogether. No longer there. Here, God calls Israel to repent as a nation. Okay? Then here, the sacrifice is made. God, the Lord in heaven, is making the atonement for Israel after she repents. So, during the Feast of Atonement, the sacrifices was made for Israel as a nation, not as an individual, as, as we'll see with the high priest. Because it should be the Feast of Atonements. Okay? The Atonements, and it mentions all the different things that they had to atone for. And then for the nation as a whole. During the Passover, every family had to bring lamb. <laughs> Every family had to bring a lamb and had to put that little name tag on it, remember? So they knew which family it was. Here, they have two goats. And each one of them represent Jesus Christ. The one who would die and the other would take the sins away forever and ever and ever. That's what is pictured in the Feast of Atonement. He would take two goats. He would reach in. It was, it was called by Mox. And forever and ever since they started doing it, when they would reach in with the right hand, they would get the lot that was to be sacrificed. When they reached in with the left hand, they would get the lot for the goat that would be the escape goat. But when after Christ died, that never happened again. Every time they reached in, they got the wrong one <coughs> in the wrong hand. And that's recorded in their writings, in the Talmud. It's all recorded there. There's a lot of things that quit happening when Christ died, just like he said it would. Why? Because he came to fulfill it, and he did. So when they tried to keep doing it over and over and over again, even to this day, the Lord had said, I fulfilled it once and once for all. So they were doing it what? In their own power, in their own way, their own religion. It became their religion rather than their relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's look on here, page 30. Leviticus 23, 32 says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month, okay, at evening. When would that be? That would be on the 9th of September at 6 o'clock, which began what? The 10th. I think we got our, I think we got our time now, okay? The ninth would begin uh, the day before. The tenth would begin at six o'clock that night. So he said, this is the time of fast. From six o'clock this night till six o'clock the next night, you're to fast. You're to fast and atone for your sins and, get, and make things right. And he said, this will be a time. And he said, even, even ye celebrate your Sabbath. Then Leviticus 23, 27, let's read these scriptures. So this is Yom Kippur. It says, also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Atonement means to cover. It shall be a holy convocation. What's a holy convocation? Dress rehearsal. Okay? Remember, holy convocation is a dress rehearsal. This day of atonement shall be a dress rehearsal for you. And ye shall afflict your souls. Now, there are 
there's all kinds of religions out there who take this scripture and say they need to beat themselves and cut themselves and burn themselves and, and all kinds of stupid things. That's not what he says. You afflict your soul, your souls. It means is that there's that inner judgment. You judge yourself lest you be judged. And, and you go and you, and you think of who have I harmed and what have I done? It's that inner examination inside the soul. And ye shall afflict your souls the fasting. The fasting. Now today they fast all kinds of things. Television, <laughs> their cell phone, all kinds of things. And offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The feast is the divine appointment. The convocation is the dress rehearsal. Now let's read about it. Leviticus 23, 27. The last trump, they have ten days to make things right with God and fellow man. It's a time of self-judgment and repentance. It speaks of the tribulation. Just as the first Passover was in Egypt, the first unleavened bread, the first fruits, and Pentecost at Mount Sinai, the first day of atonement was when Moses came back down and he was holding the, the commandments that God had written for him and for them. And he comes back down also and he tells them that you are forgiven. You are forgiven. And here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to make a place for him because he wants to dwell with you. He wants to dwell with you. And you think about it. When Moses went up, he was thinking, oh, no, there's no way God's going to forgive this. And he, so he begged God, just kill me. It says, it came to pass on the morrow, look in the box, that Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, blot me out, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Why? He was wanting to protect the honor of God. He wanted to protect the honor of God. And he said he was willing to die in their place to appease God and to uphold God's name. And the Lord said unto Moses, I mean, he said, whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Man, look what has happened to them in this two days or two thousand years. Look, and he said, but I'm going to return when they call upon me. Remember in Hosea? He said, when they call out and say, how long is it going to be? And he said, on the third day, on the third day I will return. But he told them in, in uh, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, after you repent. After you repent. In Exodus 34, 29, <clears throat> and it says, and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount, Mount Sinai with two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount this time, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face just shone while he talked with him. He had been in the presence of the Lord, and the glory just covered his face, and it was just shining. Now what is this speaking of? The second coming of Christ. Remember? He goes up. To make atonement, when he comes back down, he comes back as the king of kings, the lord of lords in his glorified body, riding that horse. And the people here upon the earth say, Cut, I cannot even look upon him. Cover me, the rocks and the hills cover me. So we see this Moses going up is a picture of Christ. Moses coming back down is a picture of Christ. Moses went up to make atonement. They would repent, he'd come back down, and he told him we're going to build a tabernacle because I want to dwell with you. Jesus went up. When he comes back down, he judges the nations. He said, I'm going to build the tabernacle or the tabernacle of David again. I'm going to build the temple and I'm going to dwell with you. For how long? The thousand years in the kingdom here upon the earth. This why, why don't people see this? This is a total picture of God's plan. And he had it all planned before he even laid the foundation of the earth. Think of that. So they said, <clears throat> When Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were <clears throat> afraid to come nigh him. 
And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, <clears throat> whosoever is of willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin tied red and badger skins and chitim wood. And we studied that. And what did they do? The people was just so thankful. Can you imagine how thankful we're going to be and all the other people? Mm -hmm. when, when we come back with Jesus and he says, and I will have my rewards with me. I mean, we're going to want to serve him. We're going to want to do something every day just to bring him glory. And so will the people here upon the earth, the ones who are saved. They're going to be so thankful, so very thankful. And these people were, they gave and they gave and they gave and they gave until Moses said, enough, you've given enough. We've got more than enough to build the tabernacle of God's <laughs> dwelling place with man. So you see, the picture here is perfect. Look in the little box. When Moses returns from God, which speaks of the second coming of Christ, he brings the blueprint of the tabernacle, his dwelling place, and the law. And he glowed. And see, there is a veil put over the face of Moses because the people couldn't look at it. They, did, they just couldn't see. They didn't want to see the future. They, and that veil remains upon them now. So we'll talk about it next week. But that veil remains. But we think, well, is the veil just over Israel? No. The Bible says the veil is also over the nations. And the veil is also over the church. Because they refuse to see Israel's part in all this. And they refuse to see our role in this. There's a veil there, even over the church. Even over the church. And it started during that stage of the church Sardis where God says I'm not happy about this you started out good but you didn't finish it's not complete you didn't complete it we're going to study that in about two weeks so we see the next feast is tabernacles and they began building the tabernacle you know when they began to build it on the 15th he, he came down on the 10th and what did he do? He said, gather all the stuff together. Get it all together because we're going to build it. And they got it all together and they started building it on the 15th tabernacles. So the tabernacle was built on the 15th. That's when they started building it. All right, look at your next page. 38. <clears throat> so we see the observance of the Feast of Atonement. Now this is the way they observed it then, but then when they got their tabernacle, they observed it the way God told them to. And when they got their temple, they could observe it the way God told them to. But now they don't have their temple, and they don't have their tabernacle. They still celebrate Yom Kippur, but they can't do the things that they will do once they get their temple back. Okay? They lost that in 70 AD. They lost that. So they, that's why they want that temple built. They want their temple so they can start doing all the things that God told them to do. Why? That's their religion. <laughs> That's their religion. I almost hate that word. That's their religion. All right, so the Day of Atonement spoke of a new beginning for Israel, a new beginning. Nationally, each year, when that priest went in there to make that sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, he was making it for the whole nation of Israel. And you can imagine, they could only do that one day each year on the Day of Atonement. One day each year on the Day of Atonement. If the priest was sick, <laughs> I mean when they got to the tabernacle in the temple, in the wilderness, they didn't get sick. Remember the scriptures say? Okay? They didn't get sick unless God sent serpents and bit them and killed them. <laughs> they didn't get sick. But when they had their tabernacle and when they had their temple, if something happened to the high priest, they were in trouble because then they had to wait a whole other year to be forgiven. So they'd have like a stand-in, which didn't do well. And then when they had their temple in Jerusalem, the priests hated the high priest. They hated him. You know why? Because he wasn't of the line of Aaron. He had bought his job. And sometimes he was just appointed by Rome. He was hireling, okay? So they hated him. 
And he just filled the position. He was like a hireling. He wanted that position of high priest. It was an honorable position. So Rome would just appoint him according to whoever they wanted to put there. Not according to what God said. Okay? And so they hated him most of the time. Because most of the time he didn't just show up when he was supposed to. And a lot of times he didn't even know how to do the Day of Atonement. And they had to teach him. And there was a couple times when the high priest was killed by his brother because his brother wanted to be the high priest. So you can see it was nothing. It was just religion. It was just religion. All right? And God said it makes him sick. It makes him sick. So Passover is personal salvation, then atonement is the nation of Israel who will repent and turn back to God during that time of Jacob's trouble that God says there's nothing has ever happened like it before. It will be so horrendous, even, even more than the Holocaust, more than all the wars, everything, to, to the point to where they start crying out to God. And when they cry out to God and repent, He'll come back. He'll come back, but not until. Hebrews 10, 4, 6 <clears throat> speaks about the atonement. He says, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away his sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. See, all those sacrifices was just a picture that he was coming. So when he came, that was to stop. But they were so deep into that religion that they didn't want to stop. Okay? And th that's what we see here. So let's go on. He said, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. <laughs> he has no pleasure in that. Now how much did they know? They knew a lot. They knew a lot. Look here in this first box. It says Job 9.32. And that's the oldest book in the Bible. For he, God, is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any day's man betwixt us that, that might lay his hand upon us both. But what is he saying here? It needs to be a God-man. No man by himself can do this. It has to be a God-man who comes and, do, and does this. Look what it says. They knew he would come someday and take away their sin. They knew that he would have to be God-man. And see, what happened when the Jews... Are you having trouble finding your page? 38. Is it 38? Yeah. Okay. So they knew, they knew he would come someday and take away their sins. They knew he would be a God-man. In 1 Samuel 24, 25, it says, Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear you make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another man, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? And then in Psalms 49, he said, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. They knew. They knew. In fact, it tells us in the Old Testament, in Psalms 103, As far as the east is from the west so far, hath he removed our transgression from us. And we hear the church use that, and this is true, we can apply it to the church. But he's speaking to Israel here. There was no church then. <laughs> right. Okay? There was no church then. The church starts with Paul. I mean, when, when the Holy Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2 and, and starts forming the body of Christ, the church is revealed actually from Paul. There was no church in the Old Testament. So these scriptures were talking to them. Now it's applied to us, yes, because the Bible teaches that he takes our sin away and forgets them and, and never brings them before us again, praise the Lord. If you look at these papers I gave you tonight on 37B, let me read these verses to you. Even if you don't have the papers, I'm going to read them to you. 37B. In Isaiah 43, 25, what's that? The Old Testament. See, they knew this. They had their Old Testament. They didn't have an Exodus, but they had it when they had their, their temple. Okay. He says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out transgressions for my own sake. He even tells them there why he does it. For my own sake. Okay. And will not remember thy sins. <clears throat> then he says in Hebrews 8.12, 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness for their sins and their iniquities. Well, I remember no more. Again, who was he talking to? The Hebrews. And who were they? Jews. <laughs> Then Hebrews 10, 17, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. And Psalms 103, like we just read, as far as from the east is from the west, so far hath removed our transgressions from us. And then Micah 7, 19, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now how do we become part of this? Because we were grafted into Israel. Okay? Romans chapter 11 says, we were grafted into them. Some of the branches had broken off and he says, don't be so boastful about them. Because I'm going to put them back. <laughs> I'm going to put them back. So we need to learn that we were grafted into them, not them grafted into us. It was their responsibility to witness to us, and it's our responsibility to witness to them. Understand? We have not replaced Israel. God has a plan for Israel. Okay? And it, it begins as soon as we're out of here, he goes back. And he starts right where he left him. Right where he left him. So they knew a lot. They knew a lot. In Jeremiah 2.22 it says, For though thou wash thee with nitre, which is like a acid or, or some, a lye. It speaks of lye. I don't know if any of you remember the lye soap that people used to make. It would take the skin off of you, not just the dirt. I mean, it would take the skin off of you. Especially if they didn't know exactly how much to put in. And don't even think about them putting a bar of that in your mouth. <laughs> well, my mama used to do that. Well, actually, she did. Daddy do it when, if I said something I shouldn't have said, put soap in her mouth. <laughs> so we learned you didn't say bad words. <laughs> but he said none of this. <clears throat> For though thou wash thee with nitre, this is Jeremiah. This is Old Testament. <laughs> okay. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap. Yet thine iniquity is marked before me. When you study that word mark, it means it was deep. It was engraved in, in him. <laughs> okay? That's another study. And he said in Hebrews, only the blood. The blood of bulls can't do it. The blood of calves can't do it. The blood of goats can't do it. The blood of animals couldn't do it. Even though they were sacrificing these animals... Every time they did, it was to point to when he would come because the atonement covered. But when Jesus went in as the high priest into the holiest of holy and offered his blood, it took sin away. It didn't just cover it. And that's why you don't have to do that anymore. But what did they do? I mean, he ripped the curtain from top to bottom. What did they do? They sewed it back together. And they continued on with the sacrifice even though the ark wasn't even in the Holy of Holies. There was nothing in the Holy of Holies. It was empty. There was a little thing that carried the, what do you call that? Urn. Urn. Well, that's good enough. That's, that's not the word I wanted, but that's good enough. And that's the only thing that was there. There was no ark. So what were they doing? They were going through the motions. Mm. They were going through the motions. That meant what? Absolutely nothing. Just rituals. Just rituals. And the Lord said, it makes a stench come up in my nose. When he started this, he said, these are my feast. But when they turned it into that, he said, now they're yours. I don't want anything to do with them. They're yours. And I think he sees that a lot. I think he sees it a lot. Look at the next page, 39. So we see that every blood sacrifice they made spoke of. Christ, the one mediator, the advocate. Remember, Moses went out and played the advocate. Moses went out and played the mediator. He was a type of Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ who would come and take away the sin. All right? Look on page 39. Let's read this. <clears throat> My voice is not good today, but Leviticus 16.3. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy men in coat. Now if you see this outfit, this is his kingly outfit. Okay? 
all of this beautiful blue and all these all these jewels and and all this, all these different colors and this blue underneath here with the bells and the pomegranates he'd take all that off no shoes nothing except the white linen thank you the white linen uh, gown that he had on underneath it all, the white linen breeches, and he was barefooted. He had a white linen uh, girdle, he called it, we'd call it like a belt, and he had his white linen hat, and that was it. That was it. So where, where did they come up with, and I know I read it, yeah. where did they come up with, they said that he would go in there and listen, they'd listen for the bells, and, and they'd tie a rope upon his leg and pull him out. No, he went in there one day out of each year dressed in nothing but his white linen and his bare feet. So wh where did that come from? They made it up. And then it was passed down and passed down and passed down to where people believe that. So, oh, yeah. And I heard it taught. I taught it myself when I first got saved. Just, wow, that's really cool. And then I read the scriptures. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> where do we find that in the Bible? I haven't been able to find it. Excuse me while I get drinking. I talk too much, that's what's wrong with me. <laughs> okay. Because if you read it very carefully, this is the Day of Atonement, look how he's dressed. Ye shall put on the holy linen coat. That's the white linen garment. In fact, everybody had to wear white. Even to this day when they celebrate the Day of Atonement, you know how they're dressed, they're all dressed in white. And sometimes they just wrap a white sheet over their clothes. Everybody is dressed in white. The high priest is dressed in his white linen coat. He shall have on his linen breeches, his white linen breeches, upon his flesh. And he shall be girded with a linen girdle, girdle, yes, we call a belt. And with the linen mitre, that's his hat, shall he be attired. No bells, no pomegranates. No jewels. All of that is his kingly apparel. That speaks of when Jesus comes back as king. Now he's fulfilling the office as high priest. And this high priest was to dress like that when he went in that one day out of the year. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. No bells, like I said, no rope. Leviticus 16, 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering. Because he had to, that's why it should be atonement. And it is in other scriptures. Because he makes atonement for everything. And then the atonement for Israel as a nation. Not as an individual. But as a nation. And each year as a nation. Okay? And that's what's going to happen during the tribulation. The nation repents as a whole. And the Bible says if, if the Lord didn't come back when he did, there would not be one flesh left upon the earth. Everybody on earth would have been dead and will be dead at the end of the tribulation if Jesus don't come back. That's why it's seven years, no longer. <clears throat> he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is just the high priest. Nobody else involved. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, the one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. The one lot for the Lord is to be in the right hand. That is the one who dies for the sin of the nation of Israel. Okay? That is, and actually dies for the sins of the world if we look at it as the church too. And the other lot for the scapegoat. Okay? But the, after Christ died, and he fulfilled all of it, that scapegoat wouldn't escape. It would go out and come right back. And to them, it was their sins going away and their sins coming back. And he said, we don't want our sins coming back on us here. And so then they decided they would let the goat go and push it off a cliff. Now remember, the, you know the day that Jesus started his ministry was during the Feast of Atonement on the Day of Jubilee? That's when he started his ministry, and we'll go look at that here in a minute. He started his ministry day. We find every one of these feast days in the book of John as he practices them, okay, and as he fulfills them. And remember what he reads on that day? He said, this day 
this is for Phil, and then he shuts the book. <laughs> what was he saying? <laughs> What was he saying to them? And you know what they did? They got so mad at him, they pushed him outside the city and tried to throw him off the hill where they throw off the scapegoat. <laughs> they had no idea who they were trying to kill. They had no idea. It was a sin of ignorance. We'll see. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. That is, for the nation. Not for individuals, but for the nation. Remember, I don't think it was this class I taught, how they did everything by nations. That's why when they go in to kill somebody, they kill the whole nation. That's the way, the, uh, it was Sunday morning class, I'm sorry. He said, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Carrying their sin far, far, as far as the east is from the west, as far as in the deepest part of the sea, carrying it far, far, far. And that's what the scapegoat was. So both of them represented Jesus Christ. It was one sacrifice, they used two, but both of them represented Jesus Christ, the one who paid for the sin and the one who took it away forever, or to never to return. And they did this year after year after year. Let's go on. 1611 says, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. First, himself and his family. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. We see that in the book of Revelation. Before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, Beaten small, remember when we studied the tabernacle, how that incense had to be beaten and beaten and beaten, and it represented the sweetness of his life that would come up into the nostrils of God. And it represented the prayers that he felt was sweet, and he would smell those prayers. And where did they offer that? Right behind on this side of the veil of the Holy of Holies. And on the, in the Holy of Holies was the ark that represented the throne of God. And when God came down, he would come down between the cherubims on the ark. And so when the prayers were lifted up, they'd go over the curtain, over the veil, into the very nostrils of God. It spoke of the prayers. The prayers. Okay. Then he takes the blood of the bullock, and he sprinkles it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. And it had to be done exactly right, God's way. God told him exactly, this is the way I want it done. Okay? Then shall he kill the goat for the sin offering, that is, for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. One day a year, on the very same day every year, okay, on the very same day every year, and he would go behind that veil, there would be one cubic space for him to walk, the narrow way, <laughs> okay. Not the broad way, which means destruction, but the narrow way. And one cubic is 18 inches between those curtains and around, okay? And it spoke of the narrow way. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle, I mean, all of them, why? They had been, blood had been all over everything. Can you imagine the white linen clothes of all these people, especially the priest? He had to bathe five times during this day. Five times, because he couldn't go into the Holy of Holies covered like that. All right, so he had to bathe five times, which is the number of grace. And he'd make an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. All. And shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. What is he doing? Transferring, by faith, the sins of the nation upon the head of the goat and sending the goat out. Okay? That's what he was doing. And, those sin, and the goat was never to come back. 
And Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel as a nation, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Now this is what they did up until the day Jesus died. Remember what Jesus said on the Mount of Olives? He said, that temple is going to be torn down. Every stone, every stone will be torn down. Because why? They had put their faith in the building. They had put their faith in the building and their religion. And he said, it's going to all be torn down 40 years later. For 40 years, they kept doing the Day of Atonement. For 40 years, they kept doing the feast. Each one of these feasts for 40 years. 40 is what? The number of probation. 40. 40 years. And then what happened? Exactly what Jesus said. The Romans came in and tore the temple down. Every stone, every stone was torn down. But during that 40 years, some things happened. And it was recorded in their writing, in the Talmud, in the Tanakh. It was recorded in their writings. And why would they record such things? Well, for one thing, they were very superstitious, but they also did believe in God, they just didn't believe God. <laughs> okay? They just didn't believe God. So when all these things started going wrong, they just tried to make up for it. Like killing the goat so it wouldn't come back. Okay? Let's go on. So, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto the land not inhabited. He shall let, the goat, let go the goat into the wilderness. It means a separation, forgotten, never to return again. He said, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Where is that written? Isaiah. And what is that? The Old Testament. <laughs> the Old Testament. Okay? Let's go on to the next page. So the Jews knew a lot. They just didn't believe. And then a veil was put over their face to where they are partially blinded. That's why some get saved and some don't. A veil was put over their face until they repent and turn to God. When it looks like two-thirds of them are gone, there's only one-third of them left. The earth is turned upside down. I mean, we talked about all the terrible things that happened during that seven-year tribulation, and they cry out to God to deliver them. Only one-third makes it. In fact, half the world's population is totally annihilated. More than half during those seven years. And you would think the Gentiles would be crying out, wouldn't you? Huh? Mm. No, they're not. They're throwing their fist up to God. Yeah. And, and they're blaspheming God. And the Bible says, and they repented not. And they repented not. And they repented not. So it shows you the heart yeah. was in total darkness. Total darkness, and some of the Jews do. Their heart was total darkness. Because what did they love? They loved the world. And they hated God because he was taking it away from them. Mm -hmm. That's the attitude. That's the attitude. He tells us in, on page 40 <clears throat> that they would tie a scarlet ribbon upon the neck of the goat <laughs> and another on the door of the gate. When the ribbon turned white, it was a sign unto them that they had forgiven for another year. Now, this is what it tells us in the Jewish writings, that they would be waiting. When they would kill the goat and then they'd send the other one out, they'd be waiting, they'd be watching this scarlet ribbon, waiting for it to turn white. And then the miracle would happen, and God would turn it white. Why? Because they had done it exactly the way God said. And he turned it white as a sign to them. After Jesus died, it never turned white again. According to their writings, it never turned white again. Well, what did that mean to them? In Isaiah, the Old Testament, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's what it meant to them. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's why it meant so much to them. That's why. So they tie this. When the, uh, when the ribbon turned white, they knew that God had forgiven them for another year as a nation. 
as a nation. So Israel had not been able to make the sacrifices now for 2,000 years. Jesus Christ told them that this was going to happen. So he came to fulfill all these feast days and all these sacrifices, and they rejected him as a nation. In fact, they said, let his blood be upon mm -hmm. us and our children. They rejected him as a nation. And they clung to their rituals and their ceremonies and their signs. And, and tearing, tearing the veil from top to bottom didn't stop them. Like we said, they sewed it back together and continued their rituals. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, it says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. In Matthew 12, 39, it says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation, he's talking about Israel, seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. He's speaking to the Jews. He said, I came first to the Jews. And they rejected him. And he said, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom when he died. From top to bottom. Showing what? A new and living way. You'd think they'd go, Yes, praise the Lord. A new and living way. No, no, no. I'm just comfortable here in my pew. I'm comfortable singing the same songs. I'm comfortable doing the same thing. And they did. They sang the same songs over and over and over and over again. I'm comfortable here. Don't change anything. <laughs> what did God say? He said that was a stench in his nostrils. Like I said, they even hated their priest because he was not of Aaron. He was not even of Aaron. And every priest was to be a descendant from Aaron. And it tells us in, I think it's in Ezra, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 2. It says, that, is that where it is? <laughs> that um, <clears throat> there would be another, there would not be another priest <clears throat> who would have the Urim and the Thorim. And if you count the numerical value of that verse, it says 8. Eight, eight. And who is that? Jesus. Ezra chapter 2. According to their Talmud, after 40 years before the Roman invasion of Titus, that would be the same time Christ died. Listen, many things began to take place after the veil was repaired. The ribbon quit turning white. The western light of the temple menorah would not stay lit. It kept going off. The temple doors, and this is one that was written in all three of their writings, and Josephus wrote of this, how the temple doors, which were 75 feet high and 50 feet wide, two doors would be 100 feet wide altogether. It took 25 men to open each door, and those doors kept opening to show them the new and living way and closing by themselves. <laughs> And what was the name of those doors? <laughs> the way that you... Mm. The name of the doors was life. Mm. Eternal life. Remember? Yeah. The first door was the way. The second one was the truth. And the third one was the life. And it was that door that kept opening and closing. And they said over and over and over again. It would do that. Do you think God was calling them? The lot cast for the Lord's goat kept coming up in the left hand. They probably did a little hand switch here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was a sign of destruction. It tells them in Zechariah 11, 1, in their own scriptures. So the lot kept coming up with the wrong goat. The scapegoat kept coming back, <clears throat> which really upset them. And they, so they took the scapegoat out and they'd have someone standing out there in the wilderness and just push it over the cliff. Just push it over the cliff. Because they didn't want their sin coming back over and over again. Because they had been taught that when it's gone, it's gone. Remember, no more. But it kept coming back. Why? They weren't truly repentant. Their sin hadn't been forgiven. They weren't truly repentant. So he began, Jesus Christ celebrated this feast day. He celebrated the day of Jubilee. He celebrated the Feast of Atonement. And he had been just been up on the mountain where he had been uh, tempted by Satan himself, 40 days and 40 nights. He comes down from the mountain. They're celebrating the Feast of Atonement. Get that picture. He goes into, he goes into the temple as he always did. 
as he always did. Let's read. He began his ministry, look at the bottom of the page. Uh, he began his ministry during the Jubilee. Listen, the Jubilee can only be on the Feast of Atonement. Nowhere else. No other time. The Day of Jubilee can only be there. And they read the same scripture on the Day of Jubilee every year. That would be, I think the last day of Jubilee was in 1980. The next day will be in 2030. It was 50 years. 50 years. So he began his ministry during the Jubilee, which was during the Feast of Atonement. They would blow the Jubilee trumpet, proclaiming what? Liberty. <laughs> and what did Jesus come to do? To liberate them. He, it, it proclaimed liberty, it, came, it proclaimed forgiveness and restoration of all that had been lost during this feast. What a great day for him to begin his ministry. You think that was planned? Oh yeah, that was planned. And Leviticus 25.9 says, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. Shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all the land. What, the, what happened on the day of Jubilee? All debts were forgiven. All slaves were released. It was a time of party. It was a time of praise. It was a time of liberation. Everything was returned on the day of Jubilee. Okay, and this is the day when Christ began his ministry. And ye shall hollow, listen, the 50th year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, <laughs> and ye shall return every man unto his family. Every slave, every debt had to be paid on the day of Jubilee. And that he'd come down from the mountain being tempted, Satan trying to get him to separate himself from the God, from God the Father. He came down, came into the temple, and read these scriptures. Isaiah 61.1. Let's, let's look at the next page, let's, and then we'll come back to these scriptures. Look at this next page. It shows you how... How we know he began his ministry. Luke 4, 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is a scripture that's, re that's read every day of atonement during that feast of Jubilee. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now you can imagine, here he is in the synagogue, and here's all these Jews, thousands and thousands of them, as he is speaking this. By the way, they all stood sometimes all day long, and read the scriptures. Right? Here's Jesus reading them. When you sit down, it's done. <laughs> now look what he says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And see, this is what the Jubilee was all about. And he says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. What was he saying? Here I am. <laughs> this is it. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. And here I am. I've come to do all this. And here I am. <laughs> this is when his ministry there began. He closed the book. He gave it again to the minister. And he sat down. Can you imagine all of them standing there looking at him? <laughs> You know? I mean, he just stopped right there. And he began to say unto them, he closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, he sat down, and the eyes of all them were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And they're probably thinking, who does this Jewish young man think he is? You know? And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled <laughs> in your ears. And then Luke, it says, and they 
and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. You know what? They knew. They just didn't believe that he was the one. And even if some of them did believe, they didn't want to admit it. Because it tells us that some of them did believe. We find that in the Gospels. But they were afraid to let people know that they believed. Ashamed in front of the other people. Have you ever said in a uh, service and someone the Lord is dealing with them to get saved and, and they just won't go up because they don't want people to see them. They're kind of ashamed. Huh. Same thing happened. Same ha thing happened. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong like they did the scapegoat. But he, passing through the midst of them, just went his way. <laughs> just went his way. He's fulfilling. He's fulfilling all the things that they had been taught to do. He was fulfilling them. And listen, they were taught that he would come and fulfill them. Every time when they would lay their hands upon the goat, it was by faith. <laughs> believing that he was going to come and take their sins away. And here he is, he'd come to take their sins away, and what'd they do? They wanted to throw him over a cliff. Think about that. Think about that. And then the Gentiles went ahead and tore down the temple, the very place where they were going to offer the sacrifices for the Gentiles. Satan's working. And he's been working really hard with the anti-Semitism. We're watching it grow mm -hmm. all over the world. It's growing and growing and growing. Even to the point in our nations, the universities are refusing to buy anything that comes from Israel or trade with any company that deals with Israel. And why? Because many of the mainline churches, and especially the Roman Catholic Church, teach Israel is no more. Those people over there are occupiers. That Israel is no more. God has a plan for Israel. He has a plan. Let's go on. So what happened? The year of Jubilee. <clears throat> year of Jubilee, Le Le Leviticus 25, 8. Let me read this. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. And then the fiftieth year was the year of Jubilee. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. It was during this feast of atonement that the day of jubilee would come every 50 years. And it was during this feast of atonement on that 50th year that Jesus stood up and said, Here I am. I've come to set the captive free. I've come to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind to free you from the bondages. Here I am. This is the acceptable year. And they got angry and wanted to push him over the cliff. Hmm. He said, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap, that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee, the celebration. It shall be holy unto you, you shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee you shall return every man his possession. And Jesus says, Here I am. Here I am. And they said, Let's kill him. Let's kill him. Look at the next page. So we see this Feast of Atonement. <clears throat> and here we have in Acts chapter 7. I want you to look at these pages that I made up for you today. I thought it might help you to understand this a little better. If you look on 37A of the pages I gave you tonight, the Bible speaks of three groups of people. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. He deals with the church at trumpets, the Jews at atonement, and the Gentiles at tabernacle. You get that? Mm -hmm. He deals with the church at trumpets, 
He deals with the Jews of atonement. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And he deals with the nations at tabernacles. Because what is the, one of the first things he does when he comes back? The battle of Armageddon and then the judgment of the nations. Because that judgment in Matthew 25, when he has the sheep on one hand and the goats on the other, they're not individual people. He's speaking of those nations. The sheep will go into the kingdom. The goat nations will not. He's speaking of the judgment of the nations. Let's go on. So the church, in 1 Corinthians 30, 10, 32, it says, Give not offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. The trumpets is for the church, the church is raptured, and Israel is called to repent. And then atonement, Israel repents as a nation is redeemed. And then the tabernacles, the Gentile nations. Now this was all given to them in the Old Testament, except for the church. They knew nothing of the church. All they knew was this. The trumpets would sound, and they are called to repent, because they knew nothing about the church. It was, it was a mystery to them. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Behold, I show you a mystery. Because mm -hmm. it was a mystery to them. All they saw was this. They saw the trumpets calling Israel to repent. <laughs> they saw Israel repenting and coming back to God as a nation. They saw Jesus or the Messiah coming back to set up his kingdom here upon the earth. They didn't see anything about the church. And all those scriptures, many of those scriptures are taken out of context and applied to the church when he was speaking to Israel. We need to understand it because yes. we don't rightly divide Amen. the Word of God. And that is what has happened all these hundreds of years. And where did it start? Let me tell you where it started. With Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. when, when the uh, Reformation began, and Luther was looking through the Scriptures, and what had happened was they were selling indulgencies. Mm -hmm. They were, they were sinning on credit. And they were paying to have their sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. Just like in the beginning of the Catholic Bible on the first or second page, it says if you read ten scriptures, I will lighten your load. I will forgive you of this many sins. If you read this many scriptures, I will forgive you of this many sins. Mm. So he sees that there's the sale of indulgences. And then he reads the scriptures and he, and he finally sees, wow, we are saved by grace through faith alone and nothing else. That's what, he, that's what he thought. I mean, that's what he read. And that's what it finally sunk in. Wow. All the things we're doing, it's not right. So he sat down and he wrote 95 things. And he nailed it to the door in Germany. And they say that's when it... They say that's when the Reformation began, but it had already been cooking. That's right. <laughs> but for him to do that, and at first, oh, I can't teach this lesson. At first, <laughs> he was for the Jews. Mm. And he was saying, you know, we need to quit treating these people like dogs. These Jewish people, because they were hated, because everybody believed that they killed Jesus. <laughs> And, and they were hated, 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 hated again. And he says, no. At first he says, let's reach out to them. Let's reach out to them with the gospel. But then when they did and they rejected the Messiah, he said, they are dogs. Let's kill them all. Burn their houses, burn their children, take everything. I have several of his comments. I have read his book. Yeah. The Jews and Their Lies. Yes. And guess who was saved under his teaching? John Calvin. <laughs> who formed the Calvinist churches. And at first he was, oh yeah, that's right. And then it was, we need to kill the Jews. They don't deserve to live. And see, that's what was not finished. In Sardis, he says, I'm not pleased. You didn't finish. <laughs> you didn't finish. So for years and years and years and years, it's been taught and taught and taught that Paul said, and it was Martin Luther who wrote this, Paul interpreted the scriptures and that when Paul spoke of Israel, he was speaking of the church. 
you take something that's been taught mm. since the late 1400s and been driven into the people's heads to where this is the church's book. Mm -hmm. There is no Jew. The curses go upon Israel, but all the blessings of our, are ours. And let me tell you something. If God has changed his covenant with Israel, he can change it with us. If he can change his word with them, he can change his word with us. But see, the Bible says he does not take back his word, he does not change, and he does not lie. And he said, I will not break my covenant with them. Yeah, I will set them aside, but I'm going to come back. But see, that's not taught. That's not taught. And that's why the world looks at the Jews as just a bunch of people who are occupying the land that don't belong to them when we have the title deed in this book that it does belong to them. It does belong to them. He said, well, what is, why has this happened? Well, let's go on. Look at this page I gave you. It says in Genesis 12, what did God do? God said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. It's calling out Israel. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. And I will make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. A blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God chose them for a purpose. <coughs> Jeremiah 31, 31 says, The day is coming, listen, behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. That's the covenant we're living under, but he made it with Israel. He made that covenant with Israel. Why are we part of it? Because we were grafted in to Israel. And we become the spiritual children of Abraham. We're grafted in. Israel wasn't destroyed. God said, just for a small moment I've set you aside. I'm going to return. Who was he talking to? Israel. But see, we have been brainwashed. It's a church, it's a church, it's a church. No, it's not. The church is only this time from Acts 2 to Revelation 4. When the Holy Spirit does something he never does before and he never does after, what is that? He baptizes us into the body of Christ as his bride, whether you're Jew or Gentile. But it's only for this period of time. And then we're raptured and he goes right back, like he said, for a small moment and then I'll return and I'll be calling for you to repent. And when you repent, I will come back. And he gave it to him in these feast days, and he gave it to us in these feast days. And, but they're, they're told, don't study that. Don't study that Old Testament. It's a myth. It's a myth. Why? Can you see why Satan doesn't want us to study it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The picture is complete. And what were these Jews supposed to do? <clears throat> he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Why does he say the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Because, remember, Israel was split in two. Ten tribes took the name Israel, and the other two tribes took the name Judah. But during the kingdom, they're coming back together as one nation. Remember in Ezekiel 36, where it says, Take two sticks and write Israel on one and Judah on the other, and then put them together? He said, I'm going to restore them. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What days? After they repent. It's that covenant that Jesus made with his blood that we are under. Okay? Look what it says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their, into their mind and write them in their hearts. It's a heart problem. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And he, and he tells us in Corinthians, Paul tells us that it's a heart problem. And when they repent, when that heart changes, he says, I'll lift that veil. But until this day, that veil is still over Israel.
world, that veil was still over the nations, and that veil was still over the church, for the most part. For the most part, the mainline denominations. And you just have to seek them to find out. Look on uh, page 37B. We're going to stop here in just a few minutes. Look in the middle of the page, the veil over the church, as well as Israel <clears throat> and the nations. The church in the world has always taught the Jews were Jesus killers. They were blamed for everything, everything. The anti-Semitism through all the ages was blamed on them, even people who didn't believe in Jesus. That means they make jo jokes about the Jews. The Jews are cursed in all nations. Okay? The Jews even themselves said, then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. But Israel was commanded to kill that Passover lamb. And if they didn't, they would die. The Passover lamb had to die. And if they hadn't killed it, guess what? We wouldn't be here today. Because he is our Passover lamb, and he is their Passover lamb. All right? Look what it says. He says, uh, Jesus said himself, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and known, and know my sheep, and am known of mine, as the Father knoweth me, even so I'm, I'm the Father. And I laid down my life for the sheep. They didn't kill him. <laughs> this was all planned before the foundation of the earth. That's why the Lord was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that this cup be removed. He already knew what was going to take place because it was planned. In fact, the Bible speaks of him as the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. As though it had already happened. It had already taken place. Isaiah 53 says he was smitten of God. He was smitten of God to pay a debt he did not owe. The Jews didn't kill him. The Romans didn't kill him. He laid down his life. In fact, he told them, hey, I could call 12 legions of angels and be out of here. Mm -hmm. He probably didn't say it that way. But <laughs> What held him on the cross? Love. Love. And he died not just for man, but for God. For God. To reconcile man unto God. To appease God. To pay the debt that only he could pay. Because man could pay it. Look what he says. The other sheep. I love this. He said, I lay my life for the sheep. He's talking about Israel. The other sheep I had, which were not of this fold. Who's that? Anyone who's not a Jew and got saved. We're the other fold. Alright? The other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd during this age. <laughs> when the Gentile and the Jew got saved, they become one. Because he broke down those walls of perdition. He broke them all down. And he said, I'll form a new thing. He said, this is the mystery kingdom. They rejected the kingdom. This is the mystery kingdom. I'll work with them for two days. On the third day, I'll come back. But on, after I work with them for two days and the body is complete, I'll call it home. Then I'll come back here. <laughs> and when they repent through that seven years of tribulation, he said, I will come and set up their kingdom. And do what? Fulfill the covenants he made with them. If he don't keep the covenants he made with them, he will not keep the covenant he made with us. Understand? We are kept saved by his faithfulness, not ours. And the only reason Israel will have their kingdom is not because they're faithful. It's because he's faithful to keep his word. Okay? But look what it says. He said, therefore doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man, no Jew, no Roman, no man. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. He said, this commandment have I received of my Father. <laughs> it was the plan. But the church has been taught that they replaced Israel. <laughs> and Luther said, Paul said, and Paul did not say this. Paul said that Israel is the church. 
No. Hmm. Paul didn't say that. In fact, we find it in Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 9 especially, and then Romans chapter 11, where he said, I would not have you be ignorant that God has set Israel aside hmm. in partial blindness until the body is called out. And then he said, and then all Israel will be saved. That's what Paul actually said. Okay. But the church has been taught they replaced Israel since the days of Luther and John Calvin, as well as many other church fathers. I'm going to bring you all the quotes. Okay. Leaving the church veiled in two ways. Why? Satan wanted them. See, there was a deception. Martin Luther was deceived. Calvin was deceived. And we can be deceived. Let's not forget that. All right. He said, leaving the church veiled in two ways, possibly even three, I'm thinking. <laughs> they are unable to recognize God's purpose for the Jews. People just don't want to hear it. Why? They're veiled. They will not hear. Leaving them, even though you can point out the scriptures that say when Israel would go home and become a nation again. Mm -hmm. they say, no, he's speaking of the church. No, he's not. Israel is a wicked adulteress. The church is a virgin bride. In God's eyes. You can't be both. Okay? So they're unable to recognize God's purpose for the Jews. They're in ignorance, but willful ignorance. Leaving them unable to understand the church's role. The church's role is what? To reach the Jews. The Jews were called out to be a witness to the Gentiles. They failed. The church is called out to be a witness to the Jew. And he said, I set them aside. If I hadn't set them aside, you'd have never been saved. But then the third one. Satan's attempt to destroy the Jews and also to keep the multitudes in Revelation chapter 7 from being saved. thought about that today. The last thing in the world he wants is for that 144,000 to be sealed. I mean, this is after we're gone. And 144,000 Jews mm -hmm. to be sealed and preaching the gospel of the kingdom right. and then leading multitudes of people to salvation. I mean, he doesn't want that to happen. So he has to sow this anti-Semitism. Why does he hate the mm. Jews? Because they're God's chosen people. They're the apple of his eye. He even set the bounds by the number of Jews. And see, those scriptures are taken and saying, oh no, the church is the apple of his eye. No, the church is not. Only as we're grafted in to Israel. We need to read that in Romans chapter 11 very carefully because they usually only preach part one of it. So Satan's attempt to destroy the Jews. I think Satan can read. <laughs> Now here's a little tidbit for you. <laughs> the Jews made a sacrifice for themselves on the Feast of Atonement, and then all these years they made a sacrifice for the nations on the Feast of Tabernacles. Seventy bulls were slain. You find that in Numbers chapter 29. I went over to Numbers today and counted each bull. Guess how many there are? Seventy. <laughs> Seventy. And see, it was their responsibility... Now we'll forget all about the church. It was their responsibility to reach the Gentiles. So on the Feast of Tabernacles, they would kill 70 bulls for the 70 nations that God had appointed in Genesis chapter 10. Think of that. They were to do that. Look what it says. The Jews made a sacrifice for themselves on the Feast of Atonement. They didn't know anything about the church. And being called his priesthood, it was their responsibility to reach the Gentiles. So they offered 70 bulls, one for each nation. Numbers 29, they slaughtered 70 bulls for the 70 nations in Genesis chapter 10. Israel was to be the kingdom of priests, Exodus 19.6. Deuteronomy 32.9 says he set the bounds of the nation by the number of Jews. Guess what? Genesis 10, there were no Jews. He set the bounds for those nations, knowing he was going to form the Jews, because he knows all things. 
And he set them by the number of souls of Jacob's family that went into the world. And how many were there? Seventy. Seventy nations. And they would slaughter seventy bulls, one for each nation, because that was their responsibility unto God to reach the nations. Now it's our responsibility in Romans it teaches us to reach them. But what are, what are we doing? We're turning against them even as a nation. And the curse of God is upon us. And don't try and share this with them because they laugh, you, laugh at you. They laugh at you. They were to reach us and be a witness to the Gentiles. And we are to reach them. Romans chapter 11 verse 30 and 31 says, For as ye, here's Paul, talking to us. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. If they See, they rejected him. And he said, I'm going to set you aside until, until, until I call out the body of Christ. I'm going to set you aside for a small moment until I call out a bride for Christ. See the picture? All right. I couldn't do it without this. <laughs> it's very handy. Very handy. So he set the bounds of the, of the people, the Gentile people, the nations, by the number of Jews. And so he says, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Because see, Israel is home in unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also should obtain mercy. We are to be trying to win them to Christ. Look on 37. Here's Peter. And he's preaching to the Jews. Remember, the first church was Jew, Jew, Jew. I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I know it's time to stop. Acts 3, 7. Now here's Peter speaking to them after Pentecost. And now, brethren, what that, that through ignorance ye did it. Did what? Crucified Jesus. Through ignorance you did it. Okay? Now see, they would understand sinning through ignorance because it was in their Old Testament. Because they didn't have the New Testament. <laughs> we have to understand, they didn't have the New Testament. They only had the Old Testament. And he says, Now, brethren, I would that, thou, that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. He said, you know all those scriptures that you've been taught, all those feast days, all those holidays, all those escape goats, all those bulls? He said, you know all that what? He came, he fulfilled that. Now what does he say? Repent ye therefore, and be converted. When now? He was telling them, now. Now be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus. When? The second time. He's saying, now repent. Repent. Because I'm going to send Jesus back. <laughs> See it? Repent. He's calling out. Repent. He said, for I will send Jesus back. Listen. He shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, after you repent, whom the heaven must receive until, until what? The time of restitution. That means God knows that they would reject him, and God knows when they will receive him again as a nation. God knows they will repent as a nation. And, God, and Jesus said, I go back. Hosea. And he said, when you repent, I'll come back. And they said, well, how long is it going to be? And he said, two days you're going to suffer. On the third day, I'm coming back. Hosea, chapter 6, 1 through 3. He said, the time of restitution of all things which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. <clears throat> Do you think it meant something to them when they heard Jesus say Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay? And they parted his raiment and cast lots, even with Joseph. Remember what they did with Joseph's coat of many colors? They dipped it in the blood and pretended like a wild beast had tore it apart. What did they do with Jesus' garments? 
on the ground. They were gambling for him. I mean, Joseph is a type of Christ. And even Joseph did not reveal himself unto his brothers until they repented. Remember? Yes. They came into him, he didn't reveal himself, and they didn't recognize him, they didn't know him, they thought he was dead. <laughs> and then he came in, they came in again, and then they came in again. And when, when Judah finally repented, when they finally repented, he sent everybody out of the room but them, and then he revealed himself. When they repent, he will come back, and he calls them out in two. The wilderness, alone. We don't go with him. And he says, I'll bring you under the rod. Just like Joseph cleared the room. Just them and me. Just them and me. Leviticus 4.13 said, And if the whole congregation of Israel sinned through ignorance, and they did. The Bible said even the princes of the world, if they had known, they wouldn't have crucified him. And the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have sinned against is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. First they have to admit right. the sin. Mm -hmm. Gotta see it. Okay, they have to admit it. Jeremiah 37 says there's a time coming when they're going to cry out. He says, Alas, for the day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be, what? Saved out of it. Who is he talking about? Jews. Israel. Israel. He said, so that none is like it. And then it says, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the tribulation. And then he says, but he, Israel, shall be saved out of it. The new covenant. We find it in Jeremiah 31, 31. I think we've just, we've already read that. But let me go down here to the bottom. See where it's underlined in verse 33? Hmm. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. <laughs> the new covenant. He said he made it with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. <laughs> From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. What is he saying? He's going to forgive them as a nation. And I will remember their sin no more. Look what it says. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those are ordinances be, depart from before me, saith the Lord, <clears throat> then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Tell that to them. What does this mean? No, no, that just means the church. You know, we have learned in the last few years that people stand up and lie, and if they lie and lie and lie and lie and keep telling the bald faced lie that yep. they believe, after all, people will believe it. I know people who tell lies and have told them for so long that they believe them. And you can't tell them any different. That's right. You can't tell them. But see, this is what they're playing with us. Mm -hmm. Just keep telling them a lie, keep telling them a lie. After a while, they're so indoctrinated in the lie that they wouldn't believe the truth if it jumped up and bit them. Right. Mm -hmm. You see, this is Satan's strategy. Yep. <laughs> it's life-changing. Mm -hmm. Once we really get a hold of this, it's really life-changing. Mm -hmm. So keep this in mind. If God took his covenant promises away from Israel and went back on his word, he could do the same thing with the church. That means his word means nothing. But Psalms 89 34 says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. What is he saying here? I'm not going to break the covenant that I made, and I'm not going to change the things that I've said. What I say goes. It goes. Thank God we're saved by his faithfulness. <laughs> Or we would be lost every day. Thank God, he says, he keeps us through the power of God, not from our works. We can't work enough to get saved, and we can't work enough to keep saved. Hebrews 6.18 says, God does not change, and he can never lie. 
You see the picture? Isn't it a beautiful picture? I love to study the feast days. We've got one more feast that we're going to study tabernacle. And then that eighth feast, the week after next, that eighth feast is that eternal rest. That's eternity. And eight means what? New beginning. New beginning. The pattern's perfect. This is a Jewish book. We are a bride of a Jew. We are a bride of a Jew. And he's going to call us soon. And when he calls us soon, he blows the trumpet for Israel. Repent. When you repent, I'll come. Then he lays seven years on them. Then sometime during that seven years, during the Feast of Atonement, they will repent. And when they do, after they repent, he said, I just like Moses, I've gone to make an atonement for you. And then he comes back down. He comes back down in tabernacles. He says, now let's build a temple. Because I will live here with you. Get the picture? All right, let's close in prayer, shall we?